Mr. Chancellor, I present to you Dr. Charlene Drew Jarvis. Most of us, if we're lucky, can aspire to one brilliant career. Dr. Charlene Drew Jarvis has lived three. Her first calling, science, runs in the family. Her father, McGill graduate, Dr. Charles R. Drew, was a trailblazing researcher, now rightly celebrated as the father of the blood bank. Madame Drew Jarvis a obtenu son doctorat en neurosciences à l'Université de Maryland, College Park, avant de se joindre au National Institute of Mental Health. Pendant sept ans, elle a étudié les systèmes visuels des primates, publiant ses résultats dans les revues scientifiques comme les Annals, Annals of Neurology et le Journal de Neurophysiology. Then, history happened. In the aftermath of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., four days of violent civil unrest shook Dr. Drew Jarvis' hometown of Washington, D.C. She witnessed the devastation of her own community firsthand. The flames died out, but the damage was lasting and profound. Acutely aware of the need for racial justice and economic rebuilding, Dr. Drew Jarvis successfully sought a seat on the Council of the District of Columbia. Over the course of more than two decades on the Council, she would play an instrumental role in rebuilding and growing her community. She led key initiatives to prohibit banks from discriminating against clients based on their neighborhoods. She introduced legislation that led to the construction of the new convention center and what's now known as the Capital One Arena, the sports center considered a driving catalyst in the revitalization of the city's Chinatown. The Housing Production Trust Fund legislation that she authored has resulted in tens of millions of dollars in housing for low and moderate income families in the rapidly gentrifying Washington, D.C. In 1996, Charlene Drew Jarvis embarked on a third career, becoming the first woman appointed as president of Southeastern University founded by the YMCA in 1789. She again established herself as a visionary leader, focusing on entrepreneurship for students, partnering with local organizations to support students' professional development. The leadership of Madame Drew Javis lui a valu de nombreuses distinctions notamment du Collège Amherst, de l'Université George Washington, du Collège Oberlin, de l'Université Howard et de l'American Red Cross. Among the many other awards, the Jewish Community's National Conference of Community and Justice presented her with the Brotherhood Sisterhood Award, and she's been named one of the most powerful women in Washington, D.C., by Washingtonian Magazine and the Washington Business Journal. Now, in her capacity as what she calls working retired, Dr. Drew Jarvis is active on many boards and committees, including boards of Oberlin College and the University of the District of Columbia. And to the McGill's community, great honor Last year, she was fundamental in helping establish the Dr. Charles R. Drew Graduate Fellowships, which provide financial support for graduates of historically black college and university to pursue graduate studies at McGill. Charlene Drew Jarvis CV may be non-traditional in his breath, but one can easily trace a meaningful through line. Whatever she wears, she's committed to excellence holds an unwavering belief in the transformative power of education and is driven by unquenchable thirst to effect positive change in the world. Mr. Chancellor, I present to you Charlene Drew Jarvis so that you may confer upon her the degree of honoris causa doctor of science.
And now I'll ask Dr. Drew Jarvis to make a small address and maybe a fourth career as a speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Bonjour. That may be all of my French this morning. <laughs> I am so delighted to be here with you this morning. To Chancellor McCall McBain, to Principal and Vice Chancellor Fortier, to Mr. Pam Panda, the Chair of the Board of Governors, to the faculty, student, staff, and guests, and particularly to Provost Man uh, Manfredi uh, and to his staff who have made this day possible for me and for my family. I want to recognize that my sister, Sylvia Drew Ivey, is in the front row and glad to be here uh, with her this morning. Uh, she is an attorney and a very talented person in her own right. I am fascinated uh, by Annabelle Sutar's presentation this morning on engagement. And I have said as to myself, as I think about it in the future, I, I shall call it staying at the table. Because I really think that that is the message that she's delivered this morning to you at McGill. I think it's an extraordinary message. Uh, and it is one that I hope to spread uh, as I go along and perhaps to have a copy of that wonderful speech. Uh, here at McGill because I think it is mind-changing and it's very, very important. On this day, when you are heralding the installation of a new chancellor of McGill University, Chancellor McCall McBain, you have accorded me this tremendous honor with great humility. I accept this honorary degree at the university from which my late father, Dr. Charles R. Drew, received his medical degree in 1933. Perhaps you can understand the gratitude of someone who lost her father at the age of eight when Dr. Drew had not yet turned 46. Chancellor McBain, the heartiest congratulations on your selection by the Board of Governors to be the next president of this great university. You were the valedictorian of your class here at McGill. How fulfilling to be chosen to lead the university at which you were a student. But you've not been a stranger in those years since your graduation. I have read that your beautiful wife, Marcy in blue, uh, here, have been longtime supporters of McGill as well as patrons in higher education in many, many places. Your most recent landmark gift of $200 million to establish the McComb McBain Scholarships at the graduate level is not only extraordinary, but the support comes with the intention of reducing social barriers to graduate study and fostering talent at the highest level. Bravo. This scholarship program comports with the highest values of the mission of this great university, McGill University. I serve as a trustee on the boards of two institutions, and as a former college president myself, I understand the challenges to higher education, which you may have to navigate. In these tumultuous times, a leader is called upon not just to manage and to fundraise, which you have done, as my mother would say, to a fair thee well, but to innovate. You fit that description so well. I, I would note in your comments, you made mention of the support of neuroscience. I was trained as a neuroscientist, as you heard, at the National Institute of Mental Health. I was trained under Dr. Mortimer Mishkin. The person who trained Dr. Mortimer Mishkin was Brenda Milner. So you, we have come full circle here in a way. She is an extraordinary woman of age of 105, I understand at the moment. Uh, and so it is with great pride that I am here because Mort Mishkin, who just passed himself, would be very proud of me. <laughs> From my vantage point in the United States, K 
Canada has always been highly regarded for its system of higher education, its health care delivery system, its public schools and colleges, its livable cities, its multiculturalism, and its relatively low crime rate. As an African American, Canada was always seen by us as safe harbor for enslaved people, enslaved people seeking freedom from bondage. The feeling of fairness still exists with respect to treatment of those of different color, religion, place of origin, or sexual identity as part of the DNA of Canada and of McGill University. It is no wonder then that my father sought to obtain his medical training at McGill University after graduating from Amherst College in Massachusetts in 1928. His sister, Elsie, died in the flu epidemic of 1918-19. He has said that this was the period of his first conscious thinking about medicine, for it happened at the time of her death that he was working as a special delivery boy assigned to the duty of carrying mail to the temporary buildings in Washington, D.C., which had been set up as emergency hospitals. At McGill, I learned that he was able to stay in the first three places in his class throughout, and that he finished second in the class of 137 with the degree of MDCM. And he wrote at the time, at this time, and this is from McGill, at this time I was broke, but unfortunately there is at McGill the Williams Prize of $500, which is awarded on the basis of the results of a competitive exam covering the whole of medicine, for which only the top five people in the class are eligible. Fortunately, he said, I was able to win this. But he's also written, things were going pretty badly at home as a result of the then crash and rapidly progressive depression in Canada, making it difficult to make ends meet. In the winter of 1931-32, I had already been to the dean to say that I might be forced to drop out of school for a while. This at a time when I already had been nominated for the Alpha Omega Honorary Fraternity. In a 1948 letter, this is again from my dad, to the Rosenwald Fund, who awarded him a $1,000 scholarship to continue his studies. He said, I myself cannot evaluate in its entirety the value of $1,000, which I received at such a crucial moment. Again, in the 1948 um, response to the Rosenwald um, folding, he said, and two years before his untimely death, he wrote a letter to the Rosenwald Fund at the time of its closing. He said, and I quote, I suppose one can never truly repay any benefactor except by carrying out successfully the program which served as a basis for the assistance. I am indebted to many people and organizations. I shall attempt to repay them by faithfully serving to the best of my ability, the sick and the dying, the young men and women I have <clears throat> the pleasure of teaching and the cause of medicine in making this world a place of less pain and more joy. My father went on to do pioneering research in the storage and preservation of blood at Columbia University, where he earned the Doctor of Medicine degree. And for his work, he has been called the father of blood banking. In 1950, my father and his residents were traveling to a medical conference in Tuskegee, Alabama. The group traveled all night on the southern highways, finding no place along the road that would accept African Americans. Early in the morning, Dr. Drew was driving and fell asleep at the wheel. Although a myth arose that my father had been denied treatment because of his race, the truth is that he was grievously injured and could not have survived his extensive injuries. Chancellor McBain, my father's gratitude for the financial support 
that he received from benefactors at McGill University and the Rosenwald Foundation will be mirrored many times over in the course of your presidency and for many, many years to come. Thank you and Marcy for your vision and for your gratitude and for your generosity and my gratitude. <laughs>